Hello, you're listening to the Science of Successful Job Hunting with me, Mildred Talabi, author, speaker and blogger committed to inspiring and changing lives in business and careers. This podcast series is all about sharing tips and techniques with you that will take the guesswork out of your job hunting. Why? Because successful job hunting is not about luck, chance or hope. Successful job hunting is a science. Welcome to today's episode. Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Science of Successful Job Hunting. Now my guest on today's show is someone I wish I had known or at least known of when I was 21 years old, fresh out of university and about to embark on a personal career journey that would involve many twists, turns and surprises. I first heard about Dr. Lewis Frankel in March 2013 when I was invited to be a panellist for a South Bank Centre discussion on women and careers. Now the discussion was based on a curiously titled book, Nice Skills Don't Get the Corner Office, 101 Unconscious Mistakes Women Make That Sabotage Their Careers, one of the many books Dr. Lewis has authored. That book had a huge impact on me because it made me realise, amongst other things, that I'd been pretty much majorly underachieving in my career at that point. So I've since shared and recommended it to um, everyone I know, and I'm telling you right now to go out and get your copy of the 10th anniversary edition, which came out last year in 2014. Dr. Lois Frankel is not just a multiple best-selling author, she is an executive coach and keynote speaker, an internationally recognized expert in the field of leadership development for women, and the founder of the Bloom Again Foundation, a charity which provides rapid response financial assistance to economically vulnerable working women. Now in today's episode of the Science of Successful Job Hunting, Dr. Lois and I are going to be talking about how to position yourself for the corner office. So if you're looking for your first or your next executive role, grab a pen and paper, a cup of your favorite beverage and come and join us on this journey. Dr. Lois, welcome to the Science of Successful Job Hunting. Thank you so much for having me, Mildred. Thank you so much for being here. It's, it's so exciting to have you. So I've got lots of questions for you and um, I can't wait to hear your responses on how to um, position ourselves for the corner office. Great. Okay, brilliant. So I guess the first thing is I know my introduction hasn't done full justice to all that you are and all you've achieved in your career to date. So please give us an overview of your career history and how you came to do what you do today. Well, you know, I think I'll start where what's most relevant because I, I had quite a long history at this stage. But, you know, how I got where I am today is that um, for many years I worked for Arco, the oil company, which was bought out by BP in uh, Great Britain. And while I was working there, I worked in human resources. I did training. I did all kinds of things in human resources. But while I worked there, I was also working, I was also going to school at night working on my PhD in counseling psychology because I thought what I always wanted to do was be a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And so when I finally got my degree, I went to the powers that be at ARCO and I said, you know, I'd like to use this degree here at ARCO in the employee assistance program. And I was told, you know what, you're doing fine where you are. Just stay there. And I thought to myself, you know, I didn't work this long and this hard and go to school for five years at night to just stay where I was. But I think that that's often what happens, especially to women. You know, I've seen a lot of women, and you know, and I was not in the um, administrative assistant ranks. I would, you know, I was in a professional position, and I'm not saying it was the most senior, but kind of middle management. And, um, but I've seen so many women who are administrative assistants go back, get degrees, get certifications, and people can't see them differently. And I think that's what was happening to me. People couldn't see me differently. So if I wanted to be able to use what I had, I had to leave. And that's really my first tip to some of your listeners. If you find that you're in a position that doesn't see that you've matured, you've grown, you've gotten more experience, maybe you've gotten more education, certification, then you may just have to pick up and leave. And that's what I did. And so I opened up a private practice of psychotherapy in downtown Los Angeles, but I didn't do that for very long because I found I wasn't well suited to it. 
um, I was just, you know, it was the moment, Mildred, that I wanted to jump across the couch and put my hands around my client's neck. But I knew I should be doing something different. So, you know, as serendipity would have it, someone called me who I had known when I was doing training. And she said, Lois, would you be willing to coach someone for us? And you have to remember, this was, oh, this was about 1987. Mm. And there were no business coaches back then. So I had no clue what she was talking about. But she was somebody who was always on the cutting edge of everything. And I said to her, you know what? I don't know what you're looking for, but I'm willing to give it a try. Tell me what you want. And she said, you know, you've been, uh, you've done training. You've been a therapist. You've worked in business. You've worked in human resources. You put them all together and you have an executive coach. And again, I had no idea what she was talking about, but I did give it a try and it absolutely changed my life. And that really is my second tip for people is, you know, serendipity is going to get you where you want to go. Mm-hmm. That we often don't know where we're going or what would be best for us or what we would absolutely love because maybe it hasn't been invented yet or maybe we never thought of it. Well, once I started doing coaching, it was like, bingo, this really is the um, oh, the way I can combine everything that I love doing into one package and really capitalize on my background, my education, my skills and my interests. And so that's when I started a coaching practice and that's been uh, almost 30 years ago. And, you know, ever since, I always say I haven't worked a day in my life because I just love what I do so much. And that's important, isn't it? Loving loving what you do as a career because we spend so much time at work. It's important we love what we do, isn't it? You know, it really is. And unfortunately, Mildred, I see so many people who are miserable Mm. Um, and not just employees, you know, bosses who are miserable, too. I had one talking to me just this week and. And she said, you know, my employers are like in a revolt. Doesn't everybody hate their boss? And I said, no, not everybody hates their boss. I would like to think that my employees don't hate their boss. Um, and that's your role as as a leader is to ensure that people are, you know, stand firmly behind you and you stand firmly behind them. So, you know, from both sides of the fence, I think it's important to love what you do. It definitely are uh, very important. I, in the introduction, I, I mentioned about your book, um, Nice Skills Don't Get the Corner Office, um, 101 Unconscious Mistakes Women Make That Sabotage Their Careers. Now, as I said in the intro, this book had a huge impact on me. But um, before we talk a bit more about the book, it, for those who are not familiar with the term corner office, what exactly is this and why is it something that you know you might want to aspire to? Well, literally, the corner office is that part of business real estate that has the most cachet. It's the one that's in the corner of the building. It's got windows on at least two, well, at least two sides. I don't know how it could have windows on more than two sides. But, (laughs) you know, it's got windows on two sides. It often has different carpeting, higher, uh, higher quality furniture in it. And it definitely has a door. It's not a cubicle. And so literally, that's what the corner office is. It's the place that vice presidents, presidents, executives aspire to have that corner office. But when I write about the corner office in my book, I'm really referring to it's I'm using it as a metaphor Mm -hmm. for getting the things that you most want out of your career. And it may it may be the corner office, uh, literally the corner office. But it may also just be, gee, I just want an office with a door. I've heard people say, I just aspire to to not being in a cubicle. Or, or, you know, a young woman said to me the other day, I aspire to not answering someone's phone. Mm. And that would be her corner office. So for each one of us, we need to think about what is our corner office? What is it that we don't have that we would like to have in our careers? Mm. That's good. That's good. And then when you've identified this corner office, whatever that may mean for you, I guess, what's the what's the first thing you would do to go towards that direction? Well, you know, I think it's really to take a look at where you are now and where you want to be. And 
in that place in between those, you know, those two goals, where I am and where I want to be, what is it that you have to fill in to be able to travel that road? So that like this young woman who said to me, uh, you know, I just aspire not to answer someone's phone. I said, so, okay, what do you need to do to not be answering someone's phone? She said, you know, I need to go back and I need to get my undergraduate degree because she doesn't have any degrees. And without that, she's going to keep answering people's phones. Now, in a, in a, exploring it further with her, I said, you know, one of the things that you're really good at is managing projects. And they have a project management certification program over at the University of California, Los Angeles, which is where uh, we both happen to live. And I said, you know, you could get that project management cert certification, and they're predicting that project managers are going to be needed in the future, that there's not enough of them out there. So it doesn't always have to be a degree. It can sometimes be something else that's going to put you on the path to a job that um, will be needed in the future, particularly if you're in a job that's not needed in the present. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, you have to be able to look ahead constantly as you go along in your career. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to look ahead. You need to plan on how do I traverse this road, this path? Um, it would also be, in addition to just getting the technical qualifications, it would also be saying, what do I love to do? Because a lot of times people wind up in jobs because someone said they thought it would be a good idea for them. You know, I, I always think about my mother told me I should be a teacher. Mm. And, you know, I did. I got a degree in teaching. I happened to also have a dual degree, which I was a degree in because I wanted to be a psychologist. But she said, you know, you're not going to do anything with a degree in psychology. Get a degree in education, which I did. And when I did my student teaching, I realized I could never do this for a living. Mm -hmm. um, but there were so many people I went to school with that they became teachers because back then that's what women did. They became teachers. Well, if you're in a job that somebody told you you should be in, you need to go back and say, but if I had a magic wand, what would I be doing? And so I really encourage people to dream a little bit. You know, you look at people like Mary Kay Ash, who started Mary Kay Cosmetics, Debbie Fields, who started, um, uh, oh, uh, yeah, the cookies. Yeah. This is Fields Cookies. Mm -hmm. um, you look at these people, and they had not much more than a dream, but they made it a reality. And most of us can do that. If we really think about what is it that we want, where am I, where do I want to be, and what do I need to do to get there? And sometimes that means what kind of relationships do I have to build? What kind of money do I have to save in addition to what kind of degrees or education do I need to get? Mm, that's good. It's, it's funny you mentioned that actually about what other people want you to do. Parents are classically the ones who try to push you a particular way because if it was up to my parents I would be a lawyer <laughs> today and not a, not a journalist that I ended up training as and all sorts so I think you have to I guess at some point be confident enough to follow your own passion and not other people's as you say yeah absolutely absolutely yeah so um I, I think in your book you talk about some of the mistakes that women make in fact not just some but 101 mistakes apparently that us women make that sabotage their career and stop them getting um the corner office or executive job can you share what some of these mistakes are and what can be done to rectify them yeah sure now before i do that though i just want to explain one thing because people who have you know you've read my book so you you get it but people who haven't sometimes come up to me after I do a keynote presentation and say, you know, I never bought your book because the title put me off. Mm -hmm. Nice girls don't get the corner office. And they say, you know, I always thought you were going to tell me in the book that I had to be mean or nasty or aggressive, mm -hmm. when in fact nothing's further from the truth. When I talk about being a nice girl, this goes back to childhood too. I define a nice girl as one who – lives her life according to the rules she was taught in childhood mm. were appropriate for little girls. 
And, you know, those messages are different in different families these days. Sometimes, you know, some, some of it can be um, ethnic. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there are a lot of Latinas in Los Angeles. And growing up, even the, those who are, you know, young and they're in their 20s, they got messages about being sweet and smile and don't make any waves and take care of the men. And, and there's many cultures where women are still getting that message. So, you know, depending on what kind of culture, what kind of family you grew up in, you may have gotten that message, you know, to a greater or lesser extent. But, but again, a nice girl is just someone who relies on old traditional messages about how girls are supposed to behave. And they don't realize that those messages may have been necessary in childhood in order to please your parents, but they're not going to do anything for you in adulthood. That you need to learn how to act like a mature adult woman if you're going to achieve your goals. Not be nasty, but not be a little girl. Does that make sense, Mildred? That makes absolute sense. And, and as you said, because I have read your book, I totally understand where you're coming from. And yeah, it, it makes sense. Because I, I, again, I was the sort of, sort of person I would have thought if you told me, you know, so dog, you know, people always say to you, it's dog eat dog world, you know, it's you have to, you know, the tough get the get the best out of life, all of that. And you kind of think, if you if that's not your nature, it can put you off. But your book doesn't talk about that at all. You don't have to become someone that you're not. So yeah, it's just about learning from some of the mistakes that you may be subconsciously making. Yeah, absolutely. That's really what it's about: is understanding yourself, your needs, why you act as you do, and then understanding some of the mistakes that you make. Now. You know, you ask what kind of mistakes I see women make, and mm. oh boy, yeah, the new book actually has 133 mistakes. Oh gosh, I, it's gone up. <laughs> yeah, it's gone up 30%, because um, when I first wrote it about um, 12 years ago, things like, you know, um, oh, like body art and social media, they weren't even on the radar screen. So I wanted to update it last year to be a little bit more relevant to what's going on now. And so it's got all new stuff. So anyway, let me just start since I said that, you know, for example, with um, social media. You know, one thing I tell women are more likely to use self social media than are men, which means there is a lot more potential to make mistakes and to really shoot yourself in the foot. And what I tell women about social media, and I especially say this when I'm talking to college girls, young women, is you never put something on social media that you wouldn't want your grandfather, your father, your first boss to see. Because what you put up there is going to stay there. You may take it down, but you don't know where it went. Mm -hmm. And it could be someone else put it on their website. Someone may be saving it. You know, and a good example is, and I'm not sure exactly how this happened, but um, there was a young woman who had worked for me, and she went on to apply for another job that was really a great job, and I, I wanted her to get it. And the the potential employer called me for a, a reference, and I had already written like a great letter of reference. Mm. And he said, you know, I, I, I got your letter of reference, but I just need to check one thing. Is there anything this woman might possibly do that could embarrass our institution? And I thought to myself, what is he talking about? Mm. And I said, I, I can't imagine. She's never embarrassed me or my business or, and she certainly has had plenty of opportunities to do that, but she never did. Yeah. And I said, where are you coming from with this? And he said, well, you know, I was looking her up on the Internet, and I saw some pictures that were kind of compromising. Well, I knew what he was referring to. When she was young, she had worked for me for eight years. Mm. And when she first came and worked for me, she was young. She had these pictures of herself at wet T-shirt contests and oh. I don't know what else she was doing. I mean, none of it was that bad. But it wasn't something you'd want your first boss to see or your grandfather or whoever. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what he was referring to. And so that's a mistake that women make is that they don't understand that they are brands in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And when you are a brand, you need to make sure you protect that brand. 
and that includes not putting things on the internet that will be there in perpetuity. Another thing about your brand is that remember, you know, people make a decision about your brand as soon as they see you. So what about body art? You know, all the research shows, and I talk about this in the updated version, that all the research shows that potential employers who see people with copious amounts of body art don't hire them. Mm. You know, and and that's kind of um, the general rule. Now, if you're going to work, obviously, at a tattoo studio, that's going to work for you. <laughs> yeah. If you want to work in corporate America, it's going to work against you. And one of the reasons it's going to work against you is people are going to question your judgment. And the example that I give here is a young woman who I did hire. And when I hired her, she had on long sleeves. And there was something about her I just wasn't sure about. But in our office, we let everybody interview who's coming in. And everyone else was high on this woman. And I thought, you know, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm having a bad day. Maybe we know whatever. There was something I didn't trust about her. And sure enough, she shows up for, she gets hired. She shows up for work on the first day, sleeveless on a summer day. And she has sleeves of tattoos up and down her arms. Mm -hmm. Had I seen that, I wouldn't have hired her. But that's not why she got fired. Mm -hmm. She got fired because she didn't show good judgment in other ways. Mm -hmm. So, so again, there is some correlation of, and there's some truth to what people perceive. So, you know, body art, I say to people, do, especially young women, I say, do not get body art if you've had one drink, mm -hmm. if you are with your sorority sister, if you've had one toke of something, mm -hmm. do not get body art. You know, make sure that when you get body art, you put it in a place that's discreet, people aren't going to see. And um, and I don't have a problem with it, but it's like that. I yeah. just don't want to see it, and I don't want my clients to see it up and down your arm. So, and that, I don't think that's a function of my age. I think that's a function of I work in a professional services firm. Yes. And if that's where you want to work, you got to be careful. So, and a couple of other things, and I'll be more brief on these. I see women make, they use too many words. Women use too many words because short sounds confident. Mm. If you add more words to what you're saying, yes, it softens the message, but you don't always want to soften the message. Women use their smiles inappropriately. They use it when they're uncomfortable, mm. and they use it more than they realize. And when you smile inappropriately, you diminish the impact of your message. Women don't ask for what they want. They don't negotiate. And um, and again, they don't always market their brands effectively because they've been taught to hire their to, to hide their light under a bushel basket. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the th mistakes I see women make. That those just probably, you know, about seven or eight of a hundred and thirty. Wow, th that's that's a lot to, to even get started on, to chew on. I mean, so like, are men exempt from these mistakes? Is it just a woman thing? Or if we've got, you know, some of our audience are men and they're listening to this, I'm maybe thinking, oh, I might have done one or two of those. Can the book help men as well? Um, you know, I'm told by men that it absolutely does. As a matter of fact, I just got an email from someone who she picked, who said she picked up the book and she was really enjoying reading it until her husband got a hold of it. <laughs> and now she can't get it away from him. Um, and yes, I absolutely think that there are some things in the book, you know, like the body art, uh, like appropriate use of social media that apply to men. But some of them really do apply more to women. Because, for example, men don't seem to have as much problem tooting their own horn. Mm. They don't have as much problem as women. Men don't tend to use as many words as women. By some accounts, women use well, between 15 and 20,000 words in the course of a day, whereas men use somewhere between eight and 10,000 words during the course of a day. So there's certain things where there are gender differences. But, I, but you know, my brother read the book, and he said he got a lot out of it. Mm. No, it's good. I, I definitely think it can apply to men as well. But as you said, it is probably the from the messages that women get from earlier, on, whether it's, you know, play with Barbie instead of, you know, Lego or something like that. It all affects you as you grow up and get older. So, yeah, that's really interesting. 
But um, I, I guess if you're thinking of um, holding down a corner office job in terms of the, the traditional sense of the word as an executive job, what kind of skills and personal attributes do you need to, to succeed? I mean, I think you've touched on some of them already, but are there specifics? Um, absolutely. You know, what you want to understand, and, and so, you know, I can talk generally about it, but, but I also need people to understand that the specifics lie in their own corporate playing field. That as a coach, that's really what I do. It's not like I go in and tell everybody the same thing. Because every workplace is a playing field. And those playing fields have rules, boundaries, and strategies. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to look at your corporate playing field and identify A, where are the boundaries, B, where are the boundaries for men versus women? C, what are the rules? Are they different for men and women? And how are they different from where I've been before? Because the biggest mistake that I see people make, both men and women, is to change jobs and assume what made you successful where you were will enable you to be successful where you're going. Um, and, and let me just give an example of how that how that works is I was uh, speaking to a defense company a couple of years ago and I was it was a group of men and women and I was trying to explain how the boundaries are different for men and women in different areas so for example men are allowed to be more assertive and direct than women because they're not going to get called a bitch right? They're not going to get called pushy, they're called pushy or bossy. Mm. That's not what happens to men when they're assertive and direct. When women are assertive and direct, they get called names. So the boundaries are different for men and women. Now, I'm not saying that women shouldn't be assertive and direct, and I'll come back to that in a second. There's things that they can do to allow them to be assertive and direct that men don't have to do. But in this case, I was just using that as an example. And then I wanted to use a more generic example. And I said, you know, let's use the example of creativity that has nothing to do with gender. And in this um, uh, defense company, I said, your boundaries for creativity are narrower than boundaries for creativity in entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, in the entertainment field, the boundaries are so wide, it's almost impossible to go out of bounds creatively. However, in defense, if you're too creative, people think, wow, that person's kind of far out. Because defense really wants you to use your um, data, mm -hmm. data points and knowledge to support any creative ideas. And that's not true in entertainment. So I was just using that as an example. And a woman raises her hand and she says, that explains everything. And I, mm -hmm. I looked at her and she said, and I had no idea that this was the case before I used the example. And she said, I came here from entertainment and I am so creative and I could do no wrong at my last job. I come here and people think I'm weird. And I don't, I didn't understand that the boundaries changed, mm -hmm. that I have to act more like the people here act if I want to be successful. And so that's really my first coaching tip here is you have to look at your playing field and say, what are the rules on this playing field? Just like I used, you know, the, the copious amounts of, bo of body ink, right, mm -hmm. body art. Um, that may be okay in some businesses. It's not going to be okay in others. So you need to use your best judgment and to learn what is okay. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would start. And then once you've done that, I would also take a look at, on my playing field, what are the women doing who are most successful? So in other words, look around you. Who's playing their game at the edge? Because that's where games are won. They're won at the edge. They're not won in the middle of the field. And too often, women play their game smack dab in the middle of the field because they're afraid of getting called out. Mm. And that's not good either. So if you look around, look at the women who are successful. What do they all have in common? Now, some of them are going to be successful despite themselves. 
And that's why I say, what do the successful women have in common? Because there's going to be certain things that they're all doing. There might be certain things one woman is doing, she's getting away with that, but it doesn't mean you'll get away with it. And so, you know, look at what they have in common and say, gee, which of those things do I need to add to my toolkit? So that's more specifically. More generically, I would give women a couple of tips. And number one, I would say, when you're in a meeting, make sure you speak up. Be among the first two or three people to speak in any meeting because early speakers are seen as having more self-confidence. So rather than tell you, yeah, you need to have more self-confidence, I'm not going to tell you that because self-confidence looks different to everybody. Mm -hmm. But if I tell you, speak among the first or two, three, among the first two or three people in any meeting, that will look self-confident. If I tell you, and when you do speak, speak as if the person sitting the furthest from you is a little bit hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. That's going to cause you to speak louder. Yeah. That's going to add to the impression of self-confidence as well. So, you know, there are a couple tips. Mm -hmm. Something else I would say when you're sitting in a meeting, make sure that you lean in and you have your hands lightly folded on the, if there's a table, on the table. That's the look of self-confidence. And so, again, it's about putting together this appearance and this package that people are going to say, there's someone I need to take seriously. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of being direct and straightforward, the way that women usually do it is they ask a question rather than make a statement. They say, they say things like, what would you think if we did X, Y, Z? Or what, would, what do you think about this idea? Let me throw an idea out and see, see what you think. Well, as soon as you ask a question, you open yourself up to have everybody shoot it down. Mm -hmm. Now, there's times when that's a good strategy. But most of the time, for most of us, it's not. You know, if you're the boss and you don't want to be seen as too um, dictatorial, Throwing an idea out and saying, let's see what everybody says about this. Of course, that could be a great strategy. But in other situations, it makes you look unsure. Mm -hmm. So rather than just say, here's what we should do, here's what we need to do, which can sound too strident, you combine the two. Mm -hmm. And you first say exactly what your proposal is, and then you ask the question, and what do we need to do to make it happen? You're not saying, what do you think about it? You're saying, what do we need to do to make it happen? So that if people have concerns about, well, it might not work because of this or that, they're going to come at it from a much more constructive place. So let me just give you an example. I might say to you, Mildred, I propose that we conduct women's leadership training in the first quarter of 2015 so that we can first identify the women who should be on the bench for promotions. Number two, we can make sure that we are acknowledging our best performers so that they don't go elsewhere. And number three, so that people who look to coming to this company can see that we do uh, care about uh, moving women into positions of leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, you can hear that I feel very strongly, and those are the reasons why I think we should do it. I'd like you to tell me what we need to do to make this happen. And and then when you pose it like that, as you've done as well, it's, it's almost like you have no choice but to agree with you. Exactly. It, yeah, because it's stated so confidently, you'd have to try and disagree, as opposed to like what you're saying, if it was posed as a question, then... The first thing you would think of if someone asked you is to offer an alternative opinion. So that just that little example is quite it's quite a powerful example on how you can use this effectively. Yeah, and I didn't come across as pushy or bossy. No. I simply came across as having a strong opinion about something and yet was opening it up for us all to discuss. Now, mm -hmm. possibly, you know, people could come back and say you know, I don't think that's where we should be spending our money. Mm -hmm. You know, when people um, show resistance to your idea, consider it good data. Mm -hmm. Because it means in order to sell the idea, now you know what you need to prepare. 
And so you may say, hey, look, what I know is that the cost is offset by the cost of a high cost of attrition, you know, turnover, not able to attract good people. And I'll get that exact data for you for our next meeting. Mm -hmm. And being able to come back and say those things. So you don't walk away with your tail between your legs. You say, oh, this person gave me the ammunition that I need. Mm -hmm. This this is really good. I, I, um, I can't believe the time is upon us, but I think what I want to know is that, that what you've just described now, can this work at interview level as well before you're actually in the job role? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because when you go into an interview, everything I've said applies. Um, when you go into an interview, you have to understand the corporate culture because they are looking as much for a good fit as they are for your technical skills. So if you go in and you think, I need to wow them with my technical skills, and it happens to be a corporate culture that tends to be more egalitarian, and they want to see how everybody's going to play together nicely in the sandbox, mm -hmm. then you don't want to blow them away with, in my last job I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, and I did it with no staff and no help. <laughs> well, you know, if our culture is collaborative, I have to say, now, she may be a go-getter, but she's not right for this culture. So you need to understand the culture, and you need to prepare your answers in ways that um, let people know that, because most places these days are collaborative, that you're collaborative. So that I might say, well, let me tell you one or two things that I've done, and then let's see if that answered your question. Mm -hmm. And so you may say, you know, the two things I'm most proud of is having done this and this. And how I see that tying into the role that you described in your job description is X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Did I answer that question for you? You absolutely so, answered that question, yes. Yeah, but, and so not only did I answer that question for you, but I would also ask that in an interview. I would ask the interviewer. Rather than ask permission, you ask, did I answer your question? And if you didn't answer the question, the interviewer, like you're interviewing me now, will come back and say, well, not quite. Can you elaborate on this? Mm -hmm. Without losing any of your traction, traction, I didn't say attraction, any of your traction <laughs> as a uh, assertive professional. That's good. That's, that's an excellent tip. Really, really good tip. Oh my gosh, I really, this feels like it needs a part two, because <laughs> we haven't even scratched the surface of this and already the, the time is upon us. So I think there's so much that you've shared now and, and um, I think the very final thing I just want you to, to just explain is, is, and I think you kind of said it with when it comes to an interview, but putting together a CV, are you able to communicate this assertiveness? in the same way on a CV? How can you do it? Oh, yeah, I know you're the expert in CV, so you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, Mildred. But I think that the way you do it on a CV is to be very concise and specific. So, for example, I am I know people disagree with me, but I am a fan of having a an objective at the top of the interview. I'm sorry, at the top of the CV. Mm -hmm. And I know that nowadays people say, well, you don't really need it. Well, you know, I worked in um, human resources long enough to be able to say, don't make me figure out what you want. Mm -hmm. You tell me what you want. And so that's the first place that you can assert yourself is, you know, to secure a position. My objective is to secure a position in human resources that would utilize over 10 years experience in recruiting, uh, compensation retirement planning and training mm -hmm. you know something and, and and again remember keep it short because short sells sounds confident then when you go down to the section on key qualifications keep it short but use numbers whenever possible you numbers and facts you want to remember that facts are friendly so what i might have is has you know and i would put there probably five to seven bullets my first bullet might be uh managed a training department of three people and a budget of uh, $500,000 annually. My second, my second bullet might be um, over, 
oversaw the uh, compensation packages of uh, international executives in oh, 25 countries. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see where I'm, where I'm going with this. The more numbers that you can use, the more specific you can be, um, the more assertive you sound, and the more crisp and professional your brand looks. Excellent. And I think that is a perfect note to end on because there's just, I feel like if I keep poking you, you're just going to be pouring out more and more wisdom. <laughs> there's just so much in you. <laughs> you know what? Instead, we, we do have to do a part two. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think before you go, I just want you to just tell us what you're currently working on and how people can find out more about you. I mean, can we find you on Twitter, LinkedIn? Where what, Where's the best place to reach you? You're going to find me everywhere you find everybody else. Yes, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, I have a website, drloisfrankel.com, and that's just D-R-L-O-I-S-F-R-A-N-K-E-L. Dot com. If you go to um, uh, Amazon.com and you type in my name, Dr. Lois Frankel, all of my books will come up for you. Uh, I'm currently working on a book that is unrelated to business, and it's called Ageless Women, Timeless Wisdom, Witty, Wicked, and Wise Reflections on Well-Lived Lives. And it's my interviews with women who are 70s, 80, 90, in some cases 100, because I feel like they have a lot to share with us that we need to know and we tend to marginalize them a little bit too much so that's what i'm up to lately fantastic that is one book i will certainly be getting as well so i can't wait till you're done <laughs> well thank you it's almost there it's almost there oh that is fantastic well dr lois has been so wonderful having you it's been a real pleasure you've shared so much with us and thank you very much for taking the time out to come on the show Thank you for having me, Mildred. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of the Science of Successful Job Hunting. If you've enjoyed it, please, please, please don't forget we're on every week. So tune in to the next one next week. And please subscribe and rate the Science of Successful Job Hunting podcast on iTunes. Because the more people can reach with this podcast, the more people can help to find the jobs they want. And in turn, enjoy fulfilling careers. So, until next time, remember, successful job hunting isn't about luck, chance or hope. Successful job hunting is a science. Take care. You've been listening to the Science of Successful Job Hunting podcast series with me, Mildred Talabi. Now, if you're a mid to senior level professional looking for a change in your job or career, get in touch with me at www.cvmakeoverexpert.com for help with your CV, LinkedIn profile and much more. That's www.cvmakeoverexpert.com Until next time, take care and happy job hunting.